Hey, hello, everyone. My name is JC Brylow. I would like to welcome you to one of our 2017 forum webinars. The session was highly rated at the 2017 forum, so we're having them back uh, to present to you in webinar form. Um, a few uh, items before we begin today. This webinar is recorded, and we will be distributing the recording afterwards. If you are unable to see the entirety of the webinar or have colleagues that would like to view the webinar and can't make it today, it's great because we are recording it. Um, also know we are happy to send your questions along to the speakers during today's webinar. Fortunately, all speakers are muted on the conference line, so we will be using the question portal in the control panel of the webinar um, software. You may also use the chat function as well. And we will be moderating those questions at the very end of the session. Um, and as for the remainder of the session, I will be handing it off to Dr. Jenna Carl and Judy Gordon. Um, and with that, Judy, whenever you're ready. So hi, this is Judy Gordon. I am, um, as it says on the slide, the Director of Wellness for the Hartford. Hopefully you're aware of the Hartford. We're a large insurance company, um, primarily selling property and casualty insurance along with uh, group benefits and mutual funds. I manage all the wellness programs for our employees here at the Hartford, and I've been with the company, gosh, about 12 years. Jenna? Hi. Uh, yep, I'm Jenna Carl, and I'm the medical director at Big Health, the developers of Sleepio, which is a digital CBT program for improving sleep, and I'm a psycho clinical psychologist uh, by training with a background uh, developing and evaluating treatments for anxiety, depression, sleep, and related problems. Um, and so, uh, yeah, with that, we'll be uh, talking to you today about the role of sleep in employee mental health, and um, can just kick things off unless, Judy, you had anything else you wanted to add. Go right ahead. All right, great. Uh, so to begin, one of the nice things about talking about sleep is that it's something we can all relate to. So I don't have to tell any of you how painful it is to have a poor night's sleep and then have to get through the day. As Mindy Kaling once put it, uh, there's no sunrise so beautiful that it's worth waking me up to see it. But there is more to the story of the importance of sleep than just that. Um, and so that's what we're here to talk about today. I'll be talking about the science behind the relationship uh, between sleep and mental health and how we can improve those outcomes. And Judy will be sharing um, the reasons for implementing Sleepy at the Hartford and the results of the program that they had. So first, I just want to spend a minute um, talking about um, why organizations end up prioritizing mental health. Um, when we gave this presentation um, at IBI in, in the spring, uh, we asked people, you know, how many organizations uh, were, were focusing on mental health. And, you know, probably over half, um, half of the participants there, or the attendees there raised their hands. And when asked why it had become a priority, there's really a few kind of main reasons. And, you know, unfortunately, um, one of the main reasons uh, can be that they're um, has been um, something, uh, a, a, a bad outcome that has happened recently uh, within the workforce population related to mental health. Um, another, another reason can be that recently uh, mental health, depression, or stress has been picked up on some type of employee survey, and it's raised, and it's raised the issue. But the other really common reason, probably the most common reason, is the high cost associated with mental health. And this is incredibly motivating for employers, and it's really true, you know, across, you know, even if your you know, population hasn't had, um, you know, a, a really significant disaster, um, it's still causing uh, high costs at baseline. And so you all may already be aware of this, but the combined costs of the healthcare expenditure as well as uh, lost productivity for mental health problems are actually double that of the next most cost costly health conditions such as obesity um, and arthritis. And even if you were to kind of hold aside the lost productivity costs and just look at the medical and pharmacy spend, it's still as costly 
as you know, the other important conditions that you know, really tend to get more attention. Now why is that? What accounts for these high costs? Well, even though we can't see mental health problems, you know, fortunately we don't walk around wearing signs that label us as depressed or anxious, um, these disorders are incredibly common. So in fact, one out of every five adults has a diagnosable mental health condition. And insomnia, anxiety, and depression, these are the most common problems that people suffer from. So what you see here are the rates uh, at which these disorders are diagnosed each year in the adult population. 20% so in insomnia, 18% in anxiety, and 10% of the population in depression. And what's more is that these percentages don't even begin to capture all of the people who have substantial stress and symptoms in these areas that are just below the threshold required for diagnosis, which is quite high. So you're talking about you know, easily you know, triple these numbers just in terms of people that are experiencing you know, significant stress or symptoms. So if it's such a significant problem, you know, why haven't we been able to address this better? Why, why is it so challenging to tackle mental health at work? And this is also something that, you know, we asked people at the conference and, and like to find out from different employers that we've worked with. And some of the most common uh, reasons that occur um, are, you know, what I was just mentioning now, that, that, that it's really a hidden problem, right? We don't, we can't see who actually needs help. Um, related to that, uh, there's still a stigma, unfortunately, around seeking help for mental health. And so um, that is another reason that it can be so hidden um, and so difficult to figure out who needs help. Now, on top of that, um, there's just a general lack of awareness around mental health issues still, and it's probably, um, you know, partly a, a cultural uh, factor. But you know, people don't tend to know um, much about mental health or what the appropriate help is. You know, and this is something that I would see all the time, um, you know, working as a clinician. I mean, mental health disorders are, are quite complex, and it's, it's not uncommon that, you know, you see patients who have a mix of symptoms and, you know, might not actually really be able to tell what the, the underlying problem is and so don't know what, what help to seek. Or they might think they have one problem when actually you know, a, a rigorous diagnostic interview would reveal that it's something else that, that would really be the, um, source of the source of the issue. So all of these factors make it very challenging to find the right help. And then lastly, uh, there's the difficulty of actually knowing which solutions are effective. I think we see many different options uh, that are potentially available, that are being advertised for mental health, and but yet we know that they're not all effective. That figuring out which one is, is a challenge. So how does tackling sleep problems offer a gateway to solving wider mental health problems? Well, it turns out that insomnia is highly interrelated and overlapping with anxiety and depression. So 63% of people with insomnia also meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. 69% of individuals with insomnia also meet criteria for depression. So what explains this overlap, you might wonder? What comes first? Well, actually, up until recently, uh, probably in the past uh, five to ten years, uh, clinicians uh, tended to believe that insomnia was merely a symptom of depression and anxiety. And indeed, it actually is a symptom that accompanies those disorders. However, more recently, uh, we've done a lot of longitudinal research that has modeled the relationships between these disorders over time and has actually shown that having insomnia um, is not only a symptom, but it also increases the risk of developing anxiety disorders and depression. So it's really a two-way street where these problems are feeding into each other, and you know, either one can, can be a risk factor for the other. Now, one positive implication of this is actually that tr treating insomnia then seemed like it maybe it has the potential to help with anxiety and depression. And in fact, um, research on, on that particular topic has shown it's the case. So, so actually, effectively treating insomnia uh, does reduce anxiety and depression symptoms. So let me tell you a little bit more about, about how these problems interrelate. 
So from a biological perspective, the interaction between insomnia and depression um, has, has a kind of specific basis. So when we don't get enough sleep, our bodies produce a stress response that activates our amygdala, which is the center, the center of our fight or flight emotional response system. When our amygdala is overactive, we become more sensitive perceiving threat. So, you know, little things that would normally roll off our shoulders uh, can make us really worried or upset. At the same time, our PFC, which is the C, like the CEO of our brain, it helps us make good decisions, it helps us manage our emotions, and really it helps us talk down our amygdala when it's overreactive. Um, well, the PFC actually becomes less capable and effective. Like, unfortunately, when you need it most and, uh, you know, it might be able to kind of help you work through a stressor, um, it, just, it just is less effective. Now, on a be from a behavioral perspective, there's another vicious cycle that's taking place. And so this begins with a stressful trigger, which could be anything, um, such as not getting enough sleep uh, because of a new baby or a demanding work schedule. And once we don't get enough sleep, it starts triggering our minds to worry about getting enough sleep or performing well enough without any sleep. We've all been there. Now, unfortunately, the, that way of thinking tends to cause us to uh, compensate by trying to cope with other behaviors uh, that are, you know, really well-intentioned, like such as drinking caffeine to get through the day or having a nightcap, you know, to help fall asleep at night because you really want to get a good night's sleep. But these behaviors, which we, you know, are hope, hope to actually help, in fact, they all interfere with, with getting quality sleep. And so they actually lead to um, that, that, that hyper-arousal um, that, that overreaction that I was just talking about in the center of the brain that causes a stress response. And so we have higher blood pressure, uh, muscle tension, and these, and these physiological consequences that are quite unpleasant and get our system worked up. Now, in the short term, these also lead to fatigue, um, difficulties concentrating, um, getting sick, um, you know, all those, those kind of um, problems of being worn down. In the long term, these lead to actually developing anxiety and depression um, and more difficult problems. So you might be wondering, haven't we solved the problem of insomnia yet? I mean, this has probably been around since as long as, you know, humans have been around. Um, well, when we ask people um, what the most uh, common drug is that people um, use to help to sleep, um, they're usually, they often, are, often know that um, the most common drug is probably not the best one, which is alcohol. So, uh, you know, typically when people um, have difficulty sleeping, they first go to alcohol or potentially over-the-counter sleep aids like nighttime cold medicines. And, and, you know, as I mentioned before, unfortunately these, um, they can help you fall asleep, but they actually interfere with your sleep quality. So, of course, are, you know, actually compounding the problem in the long run. Now, the other common category of uh, treatments for sleep is, are the sleeping pills. And these include uh, the older sleeping pills, such as trazodone, the newer hypnotics, such as Ambien, um, as well as the benzodiazepine medications like Ativan Xanax, which are really a class of anti-anxiety medications. And now, you know, all of these medications can help people fall asleep or stay asleep. But unfortunately, they also have significant risks and side effects. You know, those include dependence, both physiological and psychological, as well as uh, rebound insomnia or anxiety, which, of course, is quite unpleasant. Um, and then the most common, the grogginess, um, you know, that you can experience in the daytime, which actually puts people at risk of accidents, mistakes, um, falls, you know, particularly in the elderly. Uh, now, the worst problem, though, is that, unfortunately, the medications don't cure insomnia. So they, they help in the short term when you're taking them, but they don't actually, you know, teach you how to learn to improve your sleep in the long run. So there is a solution that is effective for improving sleep while avoiding these downsides, and that is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is also called CBTI. And CBTI is an evidence-based behavioral treatment for insomnia 
that's comprised of well-researched techniques for changing the thinking and behavior patterns that get in the way of healthy sleep. Now, this is not a simple tip sheet. It's, it's an, actually an in-depth behavior change program that is conducted by highly trained specialists, typically delivered in face-to-face -face therapy sessions over six to 20 sessions. Uh, and clinical trials have shown at this point that CBTI is as effective as all the leading medications I mentioned in the short term. And it's actually more effective than long term without the risks. And that makes sense because, as we talked about, it's actually teaching you to improve your sleep over the long run. And for that reason, uh, leading medical organizations such as the American College of Physicians have, have all uh, recommended CBTI as the first-line treatment for insomnia. Quite shocking because many people, of course, don't know, even know it exists at this time. Now, there's one additional challenge. Unfortunately, there just are not enough trained providers to, to deliver CBTI to all of the people who need it. Additionally, the in-person version of this treatment is expensive and time-consuming. So even, if, even when there are providers, there can be those additional obstacles. So enter Sleepio. So this difficulty accessing evidence-based treatment for insomnia is exactly why the founders of Big Health came to do, together to develop CPO. Um, so they were looking to provide a digital version of this evidence-based treatment for insomnia that could you know, improve sleep and mental health for the entire population of people that need it. So now I'm, I'm going to spend a couple minutes just telling you a, a bit more about how the program works. So. Um, to begin, we start with organization-wide campaigns to promote awareness and interest in sleep. And that's because, you know, as we discussed, lack of awareness and stigma are, you know, are some of the biggest problems um, or some of the first problems in addressing mental health. So that way we get everyone on the same page. We also create fun and engaging custom communications that are designed to uh, resonate with your employees and also, you know, again, keep this tone around it being, you know, non-stigmatized and, you know, important for everyone. And we get people talking about sleep through that. We also use um, videos and advertising like the one that you're seeing right here, which are, um, you know, can be placed in a cafeteria or an elevator somewhere public and just get people interested in learning about sleep. Um, and we find that it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to them because it's new. It's not something they've, you know, you know, been hearing about for a long time or feel badgered about, you know, like changing, like exercising more or changing their diet. So once we get their attention with a video like this, uh, then we ask them to test their sleep. So we encourage people to take our short online sleep test and get their sleep score. And through this initial online sleep test, we uh, tend to identify about 25 to 35 percent of employees who uh, have some moderate sleep problems or mild sleep problems and need help around kind of specific factors impacting their sleep. So for these people, um, we provide them with a uh, sleep report, a customized sleep report that gives them tailored sleep recommendations based on what difficulties they've been having. And we also refer them to our expert sleep guides that will be appropriate for them in relation to the specific challenges they're having, which you know might be trying to get sleep after a new baby or um, how to you know how to manage jet lag through a lot of work travel. And then for those individuals with more significant sleep problems who may, in many cases, meet criteria for clinical insomnia, well, they are able to self-refer into the full digital CBT program. And this tends to be about 3 to 8% of the population over the first year. And, and this program uh, includes all the techniques that are part of Gold Standard CB, in-person CBTI, um, but it's delivered in a fun and interactive personalized digital format and in which each user is guided through the program by their very own animated sleep expert uh, called the PROF, who they can access anytime by reaching their pocket. Um, so, 
uh, the tools that are included in the program you know, include sleep tracking, which is, in very, which is very important for uh, getting that baseline assessment of what help people need, and then customizing the program that we're delivering to individuals. Um, then everyone also uh, is, gets sessions with the animated prof, uh, who I would have loved to have introduced himself to you today, but um, our, our video capabilities were, were, were not at their best on the webinar, so we decided to save that one. Uh, you're welcome to, you know, take a look at our program now and, and meet him, for, you know, meet him live. Um, and so in these sessions, uh, you know, he takes you over the um, relevant uh, tools and techniques of um, improving your sleep um, for, for the problems that you have. And then we also have a whole library of uh, articles about uh, specific sleep problems and ways of addressing sleep as well as uh, tools available for actually implementing some of those techniques. Um, and lastly, we provide a, a community forum in which people are able to talk to each other and get support around specific issues that they're working on and even just kind of sticking with and going through the program. Uh, we all, and we also have a weekly live chat with sleep experts where people are able to post questions uh, that they want to have answered uh, for, to get the program a little bit more personalized and, you know, just have some expert contact, uh, which people really appreciate. Now, you heard me mention before uh, this difficulty of knowing which treatments are effective. Um, and that is a, you know, that is a, a difficulty in this area, this area of um, this kind of burgeoning area of digital mental health, and that's why clinical research is very important at Big, at Big Health. Uh, we are, are from our founder down to our uh, team. We have uh, clinical researchers on on staff, and we are um, focused on conducting you know, the uh, types of research that um, are the, represent the highest level of uh, you know empirical. Um, research. So uh, we conduct randomized cl controlled clinical trials and we publish our studies in peer-reviewed academic journals and I'm going to talk you through a couple of our studies right now but you know I encourage you to check out our website where we have all of our studies posted online and uh, you can read you can read them yourself. So uh, randomized controlled clinical trials are the standard for determining clinical effectiveness of interventions. Um, in a large RCT, or randomized controlled clinical trial, that we conducted, we compared Sleepio to a rigorous placebo condition as well as treatment as usual. And uh, treatment as usual is just care with um, the, the care that they would pursue on their own. So what we found here was that um, the, the indiv uh, with Sleepio, 76% of individuals um, with insomnia were able to achieve healthy sleep. So this not only substantially surpassed the placebo and treatment as usual conditions, but it was also on par with the rates of recovery for individuals who received gold standard in-person CBTI. And this is one of the reasons that uh, CBTI is considered, digital CBTI is being considered as um, about as effective as the CBT that's delivered in person. So what about the effects of Sleepio on anxiety and depression? We conducted a study in the UK's National Health Service in which we evaluated the effects of Sleepio on patients with clinical anxiety and depression. Within this study, we saw that individuals achieved healthy sleep by week four of the program. And this is what happened to their anxiety and depression over the scores over the course of the program. So 68% of the sample moved from clinical to normal ranges of anxiety and depression according to standardized outcome measures. Compare this with the average recovery rate in the NHS of 46%. So our program designed just to help with sleep was actually able to improve anxiety and depression above and beyond the standard of care in the National Health Service in the UK. So these results have actually been consistent across the studies that we've uh, conducted. And this is why we believe that Sleepio represents not only a solution for, for insomnia and improving sleep, 
but also represents a Trojan horse for improving better mental health uh, for the entire population that needs it. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Judy to talk about uh, the exciting results they had um, implementing Sleepio at the Hartford. And we're just going to change presenters quick so she can take over. All right, and look forward to your questions at the end as well. Hi, just give me a second here, because it occurred to me that I actually didn't have the presentation open. So. All right, just fast forward. Sorry for that. Actually, let me go out a screen show and cut down. All right, there we go. All right, Jenna, thank you very much. So you might ask, why why did the Hartford decide to, to focus in on sleep? Um, we actually have a very well-developed well-being program here at the Hartford with programs and resources to address our employees and actually their dependents, physical, emotional, emotional, social, and financial health. We knew based on our annual um, health risk assessment that 20% of our population was identified at moderate or high risk due to stress level, levels and poor uh, coping skills. And we, like most large companies, offer an employee assistance program. And we, like most of those programs, experience fairly traditionally low engagement in, in EAP. Um, so we were looking for a different way to address mental health issues, including stress, in our workplace. And as Jenna covered, it's been shown that mental health and sleep are deeply linked. And the research shows that by improving sleep, as Jenna explained, you can also Im improve mental health. So we saw um, that, by a that addressing sleep really has a unique advantage. As Jenna said, it doesn't have the same stigma attached to it as um, typical mental health issues carry. Um, we're much more likely to talk about how well or how poorly we slept last night than we are about how depressed or hopeless we may be feeling. Um, our hope was that by addressing poor sleep in the workplace, we would be able to um, have an impact on our employees' stress levels and um, things like anxiety and depression. So um, let me advance that. There we go. We also knew from our health risk assessment that our employees were consistently not getting enough sleep. 40% reported that they were getting, on average, less than the recommended seven hours of sleep a night. This is actually um, not out of the ordinary. The Centers for Disease Control has determined that 35% of the um, adult working population sleeps less than seven hours a night. So we were pretty in line with, with national data. Given how much sleep impacts um, our health and well-being, in fact, the CDC declared um, a year or two ago that lack of sleep is a public health problem that needs attention. So here at the Hartford, we believe that good sleep is as fundamental, as fundamental to overall well-being as things like our diet and how active we are. Um, we also, whoops, too far, we also, um, so anyway, so we knew a significant percentage of our employees were not getting enough sleep, and we also knew that a high percentage were at risk due to stress and inadequate coping skills. But we also wanted to look at what the cost of poor sleep um, was at the Hartford. So we did an analysis of our 2015 medical and prescription drug claims, comparing the average um, claim of a uh, claim cost of a poor sleeper, meaning one with an insomnia diagnosis or who had had a prescription for sleeping pills, to the average claim of um, the population that, that did not have a diagnosis of insomnia. What we found was kind of surprising. So we discovered that 11% of our employees, in fact, had an insomnia-related claim. 
So this means that one in 10, roughly, of our employees is actually identified in the healthcare system as having insomnia. Probably even more surprising was we discovered that these individuals had health care expenditures that were two and a half times greater than those without insomnia. So this told us that by addressing sleep, we could not only impact our employees' well-being and productivity, but we could potentially also um, positively impact our health care spend. Um, interestingly, when we did that analysis, we discovered that the claims cost for poor sleepers um, was higher than for good sleepers across all categories of spend. So whether it was outpatient, inpatient, professional, or pharmacy, poor sleepers on average had higher costs. So why Sleepio? So th that kind of summarizes why we chose to look at sleep as a topic. But why did we choose Sleepio? So knowing that a substantial part of our population was struggling with course, poor sleep, and that it was leading to decreased employee well-being and, in fact, increased health care costs, we decided we were going to focus in on sleep, and we began to look for what the right program was that would not only deliver results but be a good fit for our company. And we decided to go with Sleepio really for, for four reasons. One is um, the success of the program has been demonstrated through sound evidence-based research. And Jenna talked about that and went into some detail about a couple of the papers that they have published. That was really important to us at the Hartford. When we choose any program to offer our employees, we always want to make sure the program has validated outcomes. So first and foremost, that was very important to us. Secondly, um, as, again, as Jenna explained, the program is relevant to all employees. So there's components of it that can help even those who would consider themselves good sleepers. So help them optimize their sleep or deal with that occasional poor night of sleep. Um, while at the same time, there's a scientifically uh, proven solution for those employees who are the worst sleepers or those who have insomnia. Third reason was the behavioral modification component. So we looked at a number of programs that, sleep programs, that involved sort of simple tracking of sleep and then what would be described as kind of sleep hygiene tips, you know, things that we all know, turn your cell phone off at night, those kind of things. But Sleepio really goes above and beyond that um, with the behavioral modification component. The final thing that really impressed us was really just simply how engaging the program is. Um, the core program is delivered by the prof. Um, which, you know, is an animated virtual sleep coach, if you will, um, and he's just simply very engaging. It was different from anything, any of the other programs that we are offering our employees. So we'll talk a little bit about the results. Since launching the program um, more than, I guess, a year and a half ago at this point, we've had over 4,000 employees take that first step and complete the sleep test, and that's about 20, roughly 25% of our population. 60% um, of that group, so 60% of the employees who completed the sleep test, reported that they are troubled by their sleep. So not that they sleep poorly occasionally, but they're troubled by their sleep. And 22% um, reported that they are seriously concerned about their sleep. Um, the aggregate results of the sleep test scores, which um, Big Health has provided to us, also revealed that for those who were troubled by their sleep, they were more likely to feel stressed, um, describe their health as only fair or poor, and were more likely to miss time away from work than those who completed the sleep test and discovered they were, in fact, good sleepers. Um, We also learned from the sleep test results that about a quarter of the uh, sleep test completers reported that they were taking over-the-counter sleep aids um, to help them sleep at night, things like NyQuil, et cetera. And 8% of those who completed the sleep test um, reported that they were taking pr uh, prescription sleeping pills to help them sleep at night. So of the, as I said, about 4,000 employees have completed the sleep test. Um, the first step in the program. 
and 3,400 of them signed up for the, the um, personalized sleep help. And 1,500 signed up for the full six-week cognitive behavioral therapy program. Um, what this slide shows is, is really about engagement. So of the 1,500 or so that signed up for the full CBT program, they have stayed engaged. So as you all know, you know, step one is to promote the program. Step two is to get people engaged. And step three, and most meaningfully, is to keep them engaged so they get the full benefit of the program. And we have found that those who do sign up for the program stick with it and complete it. So let me talk a little bit about the um, results that we've, we've seen. You know, has the program really worked here for our employees? So based on follow-up surveys that are part of the program, we know that those who have completed the program have experienced meaningful improvements in their sleep. So they're falling asleep faster and they're, wake, and they're waking up during the night less often. On average, um, the employees that have completed the program have gained seven hours of sleep a week or about an extra hour of sleep each night. We've also seen um, reductions in the use of sleep aids, both over-the-counter and pres prescription sleeping pills by um, the group of employees that have completed the full CBT program. Program participants have also reported that they're missing less time from work due to their poor sleep. And while they are at work, they're able to be much more focused than they were um, prior to completing the, the CBT program. And I, I would say probably most importantly, just as we had hoped when we focused, decided to focus on sleep improvement, um, we've seen meaningful improvements across mental health measures, whether it's stress, anxiety, or depression levels. So program participants are reporting that they're feeling, now that they've completed the program, they're feeling less stressed, they're experiencing lower levels of anxiety and depression as well. And I think the last thing I would say before we open it up for questions um, is that not only has the program been effective in achieving the outcomes we had hoped for, our employees really love it. Um, very high satisfaction levels, I think, because of the you know, personal outcomes that people are able to achieve, but also because it's very different and engaging and it's, um, it's, kept, it's kept their attention and focus. So, We've achieved the outcomes that we hoped we would achieve when we decided to focus on sleep. Um, and at the same time, um, we've got high satisfaction levels with the program as well. So I think with that, we're going to open it up to questions um, for Jenna and I. Um, so I'll go ahead and start the Q&A. Uh, this one is, is uh, either for both Jenna and, and Judy, can you talk a bit more about um, or if there's been any studies around the, the direct results of perhaps getting, as you had mentioned, um, like that seven extra hours a week? Like what, what types of health improvements can you chart from an employee, you know, gaining an average of, you know, an extra eight hours a week? <laughs> Um, this is this is Judy. I'll I'll jump in. So I think the improved sleep um, has resulted in the other outcomes that employees have reported. So when you complete when you go through the program, you begin by taking a sleep test, and that's sort of your baseline data. And at the completion of the program, there's a um, more surveying that is done to to measure change from from baseline. So while we've seen things like um, uh, longer sleep and less and more um, um, or less waking up during the night, if you will, We've, that has resulted in the outcomes that I just discussed. So employees are also reporting feeling less stressed, less anxious, less depressed, and as a result, more productive at work. 
So, Jenna, would you add to that? Anything? Hi, sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, no, I, I, um, I think that's, I think that's, that's a great answer, and uh, it's something that we, you know, assess generally, um, but not, but actually, um, really like looking more specifically at health outcomes isn't um, isn't something we typically do with with the um, with the program, um, though that is something that we are interested in doing in some separate larger studies. Uh, where we exa where we examine the health effects in a bit more detail, um, there is a literature literature on that 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 exists. So I think we can just draw from that as well, um, which is essentially to you know we do know from that that when you improve sleep, you are able to impact um, um, the health outcomes that we that we sort of discussed in the presentation in terms of um, you know illness, um, the obesity. Um, and the other uh, other types of more chronic health conditions that that commonly occur. Great. Um, let's see some audience questions. Uh, did the Hartford analysis take into consideration the other health conditions of the non-sleepers? Uh, could this actually be the cause of the lack of sleep? Um, and then yeah. also, also, did did uh, the Hartford measure presenteeism? Great. Um, well, just in terms of the um, the health condition uh, question, um, so in the analysis uh, of the um, out, in the analysis of the Harper, um, we did not take into consideration um, health conditions. We did not control for health conditions in the non-sleepers, um, but this is something that actually again has been done in the literature, and um, you typically see 75% higher cost for non-sleepers, um, you know, controlling for health conditions. Okay. Um, you also asked about the, the uh, measure of presenteeism, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah and so for that, we used a scale um, that is uh, typically used to measure absenteeism and presenteeism, and it is called the work productivity and activity impairment scale. Um, and we selected items for presenteeism from that, which is a you know standardized, reliable um, assessment instrument. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, we have a few other questions. Um, uh, this is a good one. How many um, many employers are concerned about workers' comp claims? Is there with benefits spend, has the Hartford seen any change in the workers' comp claims as well as SUV and LTD due to sleepio? Yeah, that's a great question, and it, it's something we haven't looked at but would love to do that. I think that's a really good question. So we're actually in conversations with um, Big Health about additional research we want to do now that we're a year and a half or so um, into the program and feel like we now have some data around, um, you know, uh, a, a, a number of people who have completed the program. So it is an analysis we want to do, and we haven't done that yet. Great. And, and some of these questions um, to the audience, um, I think it's, it would actually be better answered um, with some of the speakers over email correspondence. Um, they're a bit more specific about the program itself and costs around the program. So for the recording, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and pass that information along to the speakers afterwards. Um, let's see. Uh, what are your key learnings for implementation and communication with your covered lives? Um, what's the best thing that um, you were able to do with the program, and what was, what was your biggest mistake in, in the implementation? Oh, that's a great question. Um, one thing I do want to comment on, because I didn't mention it in the beginning, and you saying covered lives made me think of it. So we made the program available to all employees, whether they're participants in our health plan or not, as well as all spouses and, and uh, domestic partners, again, whether or not they're in our health plan. And we did that because we felt um, it was a very important program that all employees should have, should have the opportunity to participate in. And we wanted um, really a big health advice to open it up to spouses and domestic partners as well because kind of 
obviously sometimes the quality of your sleep is impacted by the person you're sleeping with. So we wanted to open the program up um, to as widely as we could. So I would say in terms of implementation, what was most successful was, was really using the materials that were provided to us by Big Health. So here at the Hartford, like a, you know, a lot of companies, I'm sure folks who are on this call can appreciate this, we have certain brand standards and we have an internal communications team that you know, manages the uh, marketing and communication about our various wellness programs. But the uniqueness of this program and the animation of the, of the prof was really important to maintain um, in the communication. So for, as an example, we have plasma screens in our buildings that we use heavily to promote our programs. Rather than use sort of our standard template that we would normally use, brand approved standard template for those plasma screens to promote this program, we used, um, for instance, the video that uh, Jenna showed a little clip of. I think it was really important for um, employees to get a feel for the program. And really for that to happen, we our brand people agreed to rely on what was given to us by Big Help. So I think that got people's attention, honestly, because it was different than what they had seen before. So I would say I would, I would give that advice, if you can, to, to really rely on the communication materials that they will provide to you. Lesson learned. Um, Gosh, that's a good question. I think we had a pretty smooth, I know we had a smooth implementation. We've had great engagement levels. I think the key with any program is to maintain the engagement. Um, it's, it's often easy to launch something new. It's, it's new, it's, it's, it's exciting, gets people's attention, and they engage quickly. But you really want to be able to sustain that. So I don't know that that's a lesson learned or anything we did we did wrong, but with all programs, we have to constantly think about how do you keep it fresh and how do you keep it um, in front of employees. So that's that's a challenge really with any program, um, and we think about that a lot. Great. And then would you, um, kind of piggybacking off of that, would for for those who may be thinking about implementing a similar program and or um, or in the process of starting a program that is like this, what is something, what are perhaps the three biggest takeaways that you can think um, uh, from your, your experience that you would recommend to anyone in, the, in this process? So I think my answer would apply really to the way in which we, we really roll out any new program here, um, so not necessarily sleepio specific. But when we're, when we're thinking about a new program, first of all, we rely on the data to guide us about what are the issues that, that we should be looking at addressing. So as I said, we have a very well-developed, and I'll say award-winning, um, wellness program here at the Hartford. And we, we really rely on data, whether it's claims data or health risk assessment data, to, to inform us so we understand the health status of our population. So I would always recommend you start there, um, not with you know, what's getting headlines um, in the media, but really what's, what is your population need. So for us, it's why you know, we, we knew stress levels were high here because the data showed us that, and we were really looking at alternative ways to kind of get at stress and mental health issues beyond you know, the traditional ways. So that's one thing I would say. Um, the other thing that we typically do here is we, we kind of kick the tires of any new program before we roll it out across our enterprise. For us, that's roughly 17,000 employees. Um, across the United States. So we, we typically pilot a program, and it may be just with a small group of staff members from our corporate health and wellness organization, of which I'm a part, or we pull in employees and, um, and do a, a small pilot. Because we want to make sure that while we think this might be an engaging program and will resonate with our employees, we want to test that before we kind of go large scale. So I always recommend that as well. The other um, 
the other thing I think that is helpful for us, and, and many of you on the phone may have the same thing, but we have a network of wellness champions here at the Hartford, roughly 100. And these are employees who volunteer their time to really do two things, kind of help us get the word out about our, the programs that we're offering our employees, but also to provide valuable feedback to me about what they're hearing out in the field, what's confusing to employees, what are the needs that they're hearing. And so when we launch a program like a Sleepio, we always engage our wellness champions first. So they preview any program, they're, they're well aware of it, they can answer questions if their coworkers ask them questions. So those are, I guess, three things that I would, I would suggest. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then we have time for about two more questions. So one, one is, um, can you describe and, and or clarify what the sleep, the initial sleep test looks, looks like? Um, is it self-administered? Is it at home or is it at a clinic? And can you explain the, the process under which an employee would be assessed? Yeah, absolutely. So it is, um, it is an online sleep test. Uh, it's meant to be very short and feasible, uh, so it takes about two minutes, 10, ten questions, and it is um, a clinically validated assessment measure for sleep, uh, which, core, which uh, gives us information about, um, you know, their overall sleep needs as well as um, likelihood of being diagnosed with clinical insomnia as well. Awesome. I'm sorry, Jenna, can I just add, so once you complete that short sleep test, you get a sleep score, which you saw in the video. Um, and then there's a more detailed questionnaire that follows, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, the, there's um, a longer sleep assessment um, once people um, decide to opt into the program, uh, which, which then we can give them more detailed information from. So that initial sleep test really sort of just gives the, the completer a sense of, oh, should I go further in this program? You know, what's my sleep really look like? and it's very quick. Um, we at the Hartford have a pretty diverse workforce. Um, we have a pretty significant number of call center type employees whose time is very limited and controlled. Um, it's another thing that we look at when we roll out a new program. So it's another reason this appealed to us because the sleep test gets people's attention and it's very quick to do. Um, and then if employees want to enroll in the full program and don't have the luxury of time at work, it's something they can, they can also complete um, after work, not work hours. Awesome. Um, and then the last question, and I think this is uh, an audience member wanted to know uh, what, what Big Health is going after next, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it a bit and ask, you know, after having worked with the Hartford and, and you know, perhaps other clients around sleep, is there any learned lessons on your end as a vendor in, de you know, designing programs, um, you know, trying to learn how they impact the bottom line um, or how they can better impact the bottom line? And, and with that knowledge, where will you be going in the future? Hmm. Um. Thanks. No, that's a good question. Uh, so, I mean, I am more on the clinical side of things and uh, <laughs> focus less on the business side. Um, so, I would say that, I mean, we are, we are really like our values are driven from a uh, helping millions back to good mental health, and we, I think, we really believe that. Um, and I think the data shows that doing that, we know that we trust that doing that um, brings about um, significant savings in many, you know, tangible and intangible ways. Um, at the same time, um, absolutely, you know, every um, employer we work with, we're kind of working, or we have, a, you know, a full, a full team that is um, helping work with them to figure out what are, what, are the, um, what are the outcomes that are being most important for that organization. And, you know, it actually, it varies. I mean, every, the kind of, the, the ROI for each company can be different. Um, so we, you know, we, we find that for some, um, you know, for some it's cost savings. Um, for others, it is uh, employee happiness. Um, 
And so I think we're actually, uh, we're, we are always kind of doing um, specific analyses with each company. So it's really try to help them understand what outcomes, that, what, what the effect is going to be on the outcomes that they care most about. So there's probably lots of different ways that we could look at that. Uh, and we are, you know, focused. We do think sleep is, as, is a very unique opportunity for kind of, like, you know, as I mentioned, this Trojan horse for addressing many outcomes related to, you know, mental health and health. Um, but also, you know, there are, there are a lot of people, um, as we talked about, that do have, um, you know, really, you know, uh, clinical levels of anxiety and depression and, and may need additional specific treatment for that. So we are also um, working on, uh, you know, providing uh, treatment for depression and anxiety beyond um, what's covered in, this, in the scope of sleep as well. Awesome. That's good to hear. It's always interesting to, I know employers are always asked about what, what they do to improve, but sometimes I think we should be asking the same thing of the suppliers and the vendors, and, and I'm sure they do um, take that into account. So it's good to hear that Big Health is, you know, constantly evaluating um, evalu evaluating the tools that they have to, to work with, you know, their specific population. Um, so I think this is approaching the end of the hour, and there are some questions that the audience had asked that I think are, are best answered um, in email with the speakers themselves. Um, so we'll be happy to pass those along. Um, as for the webinar, this is recorded. We will be sharing this with the audience members and posted um, on um, a public setting for the IBI website, sharing it with the speakers as they may share it with their networks as well. Um, and with that, I wanted to thank both Jenna and Judy for taking that, the time out of their day to, um, again, give an excellent presentation about the importance of sleep and employee health. Um, and with that, would either Judy, Jenna, anything in closing? No, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity again. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, JC uh, and Judy. And uh, just to add, you know, for any um, for any of the listeners who do have more specific questions, um, you know, our team would be delighted to answer them. And probably the easiest way of um, getting those uh, asked is just going on our website to the Contact Us page and uh, putting in any questions you have, and we can get back to you. Okay. And it's, well, yeah, it's big, big help, bighelp.com, so easy to find. All right. Thank you all, and we hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your work week, and we will be following up with the recording in an email here very shortly.